Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, Stone Game 2. This is a pretty weird problem and that's kind of why I like it. And I have solved the previous one if you want to check that video out. The story is the same. We have two people, Alice and Bob, that are taking turns grabbing stones from a pile of stones. In this case, it's an array. So let's take this for example. And we have, remember, two players. I'm just going to call them A and B for short. Player A is going to go first. They're going to start at the two. Now, in terms of the choices that they can make, we're given another variable and this is going to be fixed. So you can see it's not a parameter in this problem. It's just a fixed variable initially, m equal to one. So that does not mean that Alice can choose from only the first pile. It actually means she can choose from two times this value. So she can choose from the first two piles. And when I say choose from, I mean like either she can take just this stone or she can take both stones. All stones are going to be a positive value. And what we're trying to do in this problem is maximize the score of Alice. So of course, you might think that we should just be greedy. We should always just take both stones. But this first example actually illustrates why we shouldn't do that. Because suppose Alice does take both stones. And I'm going to make a player be red just to make it more obvious. We can actually update our M value. And it was actually one originally. Sorry for making it two. Now we update our M value by always setting it to the max of either itself, which is, you know, one in this case or the x value and x is basically the number of stones that were chosen in the previous turn and in the previous turn you can see alice chose two stones so in this case the max is going to be two so therefore m is now going to be equal to two and so now when player b goes that doesn't mean they can choose from the first two that means they can choose from two times this value. So Bob can actually choose four piles, but we only have three left. So that's an edge case. You definitely don't want to go out of bounds. Keep that in mind. For the first three, of course, Bob is trying to maximize his own score because what they tell us is we're running a simulation assuming that both players play optimally. Now, of course, neither of the players can predict the future. They can't see what all of the stones are. So in a sense, we will have to brute force it. We will have to try multiple piles possibilities. So in this simulation that we ran, Alice had a score of nine, but Bob had a score of 18 plus four, which is 22. There's only one other simulation in this case, and that's if Alice were to have only chosen the first stone. So Alice chooses just two. And the reason that's good is because M started as one. And now to update M, we take the max of itself one or the X value, which in this case was one because Alice just chose a single stone. So now M is going to stay one. Even though Alice only got a single stone, the good thing is that now Bob can either choose just a single stone or choose two stones. So I guess technically we do have more than two choices. You can imagine the way I'm going through this could be simulated with a decision tree where we're keeping track of one, whether we have Alice or Bob going, we can use like a Boolean flag probably for that, or you can use an integer one or two or one or zero, but there's only going to be two possibilities for that parameter. The other is going to be the index that we are at now. So like we could be at this index, we could be here, we could be here. And you know, the index tells us what the sub problem now is. And the first sub problem or really starting at the beginning is the entire problem itself. And the third parameter is going to be M, even though it always starts as one, as we go through the array, we could be at this position and we could have a completely different M value depending on how we got here. Like in this decision tree, depending on the branch that we took, M here might end up being one M here might end up being two. And you can imagine what the M value is definitely does affect the result of this problem. We have three variables, the index, the M value, and whether we have Alice or Bob, this one probably isn't going to affect the time complexity too much because there's only two possible choices here. This one probably is. I can be up to N values where let's say N is the length of this input array and M technically this one. Yes, it starts as one. So you might think it's fixed, but how big could this possibly grow? Because in the worst case, it could pretty much double on every level of the tree. In the worst case, M might get to the point where it's literally as big as the input array N. So the number of possible states 
for this recursive function, this brute force function is going to be n squared, where by states, I mean like this is the number of combinations we could pass into that recursive function. Technically, it would be two times n squared because we do have the Alice or Bob flag. But this is kind of a hint that this problem can be solved with recursive dynamic programming or, you know, AKA memoization. I won't go super deep into the time complexity right now. That'll be easier to analyze when we code it up. I'd never finished this example. So let's look at this point. Let's say Bob just chose the seven. Then over here, if Alice wants to play optimally, she has a choice of either just choosing the nine, in which case Bob's probably gonna take the last two, or Alice can choose both of these, in which case Bob is gonna take this one. So assuming this is the case where of course, Alice wants to play optimally, she's gonna take both of these. She gets a score of I think 20 and Bob gets 14. But just because Alice played optimally doesn't necessarily mean that Bob played optimally. Why would Bob just choose a single value over here? Bob is trying to maximize his own score as well. And I said 14, but I think it was 11. My math is off today. Is it possible for Bob to have a higher score than 11? Like if he had chosen here something differently? Probably because if he takes both of these values, he's definitely at least getting a 16. So that's probably the optimal move for Bob. And when now Alice goes, she's just going to take both of these, giving her a score of two plus 13, which is going to be 15. So that's probably the optimal path. This is probably the solution because not only is Alice playing optimally, but Bob is also playing optimally. But how do we algorithmically keep track? Like, how do we know if Alice is playing optimally and Bob is playing optimally? Because if we were just focusing on Alice, it'd be pretty easy. Like we'd have our choice. We either choose the two or we choose the two and seven. So like just keeping track of Alice's score, it could either be a two or a nine. And then recursively, maybe from here and here, we want to choose this or this. And among these two, we want to get the maximum so that we can add it to the result. But we know that after every turn, it's alternating here. It's not going to be Alice going. It's going to be Bob. So if from here, we return the score that Bob gets from Alice's perspective, we wouldn't want to maximize that. We would want to minimize that. So in a way, what we could do is from Alice's perspective, we could use the return value and actually take the minimum and not add it to the result. But the problem with that is while it would kind of guarantee that Alice plays optimally, what we're ultimately trying to do is calculate the score of Alice if she played optimally. So what this function should ultimately do, this recursive function, it should return Alice's score. Even though I drew this in red, we know we're talking about Alice here. What my whole point with this is that now from Alice's perspective, it will be like the return values from here. And I shouldn't even put the two and nine here because the return value here will be the score and we'll take the maximum of these two. I should be putting like the pointer that we're at here we're at i equals one and here we would be at i equals two originally let's say we started at you know the zeroth index here it's going to be bob's turn and when bob makes a turn we still know that the return value for him is also going to end up returning Alice's score to him, but he's not trying to maximize Alice's score. He's trying to minimize Alice's score. So what we say is alternating on each level of the tree from here, we know it's Alice's turn. So we would take the maximum of these two return values from here. We know it's Bob's turn, so we would take the minimum of these two return values. You might think, then how are we going to calculate Bob's score? Well, do we need to calculate Bob's score? I mean, to me, it doesn't really look like we need to. As long as we calculate Alice's score and we guarantee that Bob and Alice are both playing optimally, we don't need to calculate Bob's score. Bob's score won't be stored anywhere, nor will this function return Bob's score at all. On any level of this, we will not be returning Bob's score. We're only calculating Alice's score. That's the main idea behind this problem, but it probably won't make sense until I actually show you the code. So now getting into the code, like I said, we can solve this recursively and we're going to have three variables. The first is going to be the flag telling us whose turn it is. Second is going to be the index and third is going to be the M value. And remember this function is only returning the number of stones Alice gets. It's always going to be the return value. And the edge case is of course, when we go out of bounds, if I is equal to the length of piles, then we return zero because if we run out of piles, Alice's score is going to be zero regardless of if it's her turn or not. 
Otherwise, we want to calculate the result. So first, I'm going to initialize it to zero, but I'm going to leave a comment. We will change this once we have a bit more information. But we know for Alice, we're trying to maximize her score. So setting the result to a value of zero isn't bad. And we know this is going to be the same result that we end up returning. But now remember, what's our choice at this point? Well, that's what our M value is for. And here, I'm not going to use the pointer I because one, we already used it up here. And in the context of this problem, that was the X value that we were talking about. So I'm just going to say for X in range from one up until two times M. Now I am adding a plus one here because this is non-inclusive in Python, but we know that the possible range of values is going to be from two up until two times M. Remember, we're not just taking the pile at the index. And how would we even find the index? Well, we'd say I plus M. X, but this is not quite right because our X in this case is starting at one. So this would basically mean we always skip the ith value. That's not what we want to do. If we're currently at the I index, that's our first choice. So to offset that, we do put a minus one here. But again, we don't just choose this pile. We're choosing a prefix starting at I. We're either going to choose the first pile or the first two piles or the first three piles, etc., etc. So you would think maybe we'll have a nested loop in here, but I'll tell you, we don't need to do that. We can just store that prefix sum, AKA the total sum of the stones and store that in a variable. And on each iteration of the loop, just add to that variable. So here I'm just going to say total add to that this. Okay, cool. That tells us the total that Alice could choose on this iteration of the loop or on this branch of the tree. There is one slight bug here though. What if this ends up going out of bounds? What if I plus X minus one is out of bounds? It's not like we're checking that anywhere. We could add like a minimum here, like to make sure that X doesn't exceed the length of piles, but I'm actually just going to put that in an if statement because I think it's a little bit more simple to do it that way. Like this line will get pretty fat if I try to add like a minimum in there. So I'm just going to say if I plus X is greater than the length of piles, then I'm going to not return. I'm going to break out of this loop because we went out of bounds. Now you might be thinking, well, what if it's equal to piles? Isn't that the appropriate case? No, because notice how we do have the minus one over here. So if you really want to make it equal, you should say X minus one is equal to this. I don't know what's more simple, uh, this one or the previous one, but I'll just leave it like this for now. You can do whatever uh, makes more sense for you. Now we have our recursive case and right off the bat, I'm just going to tell you, remember, we're going to do it slightly differently depending on whose turn it is. If it's Alice's turn, we're going to do it slightly differently. When it's Bob's turn, we're going to do it slightly differently. For Alice, we know we're trying to maximize her score. It's her turn right now, and we want to maximize her score. So we want our result to be the maximum of either itself or the DFS recursive call after we choose this many stones. So how would we update our recursive call? Well, if it's Alice's turn, we want to pass in false here probably, or to make it a little bit more simple, you could just pass in not Alice, because we're always just going to take the negation of this, no matter which uh, recursive call we make. For where our pointer now is going to be at, if we started at X and we took this many stones, we're just going to take I plus X and say that's our new starting point. And what about our M value? How do we update that? Well, that is something that they pretty much just told us. We take the max of either itself or the X value that we ended up choosing. Not bad, right? This is the simple case where for Alice, we want to maximize her score. Now here where we take Bob's turn, remember the return value of this recursive call is not going to be Bob's score. We don't care about Bob's score. We're not calculating Bob's score here. We're calculating Alice's score, believe it or not. It just happens to be Bob's turn. And with Alice's score, when it's Bob's turn, we don't want to maximize that. We want to minimize that. So we take the minimum of the result and the DFS call, which I'll fill in in just a second. If we're trying to minimize something and we already set it to zero in the first place, that's probably not going to work. So we're coming back to this comment. We're going to initialize that to zero if it's Alice's turn, but otherwise let's set it to like a really big number that we can then try to minimize. And we know for sure that the result will never actually return float of infinity for Alice's score here because we know our base case is going to be zero. So I just wanted to clear that up. Now to fill in the DFS for Bob's turn, it's going to be pretty similar. We just pass in not Alice, and I probably shouldn't capitalize Alice here or over here. 
And for the X value, we do the exact same thing. We set it to I plus X. And for updating M, again, we do the same thing, M and X. Looking at it, these are pretty much the, exactly the same recursive call. So maybe you could even break it out somewhere, but I think for readability, it's not like a huge deal or anything. When we do minimize this value, we're gonna assign it to the result here. And then we're returning the result. And ultimately we want to call this DFS starting with Alice's turn. So we pass in true for the first variable. We start at index zero and we know our M value is always going to start at one. So that's pretty much the whole code, but this is a very, very brute force approach. This is exponential. Not only will we be branching two times at each step, we could be branching multiple times. So now let's add a little bit of caching to this. You could call it a DP or you could call it cache. And in my case, I like to use a hash map, but a three dimensional array, I believe would work as well. And it's just as easy as checking if this combination of parameters was already passed in, meaning it's already stored in our DP cache, then we're going to return the value that we ended up storing in that DP cache. If it's not already stored, then that's what we're calculating, of course. So before we end up returning the result over here, let's make sure to throw it in to the DP cache, Alice I M and storing the result before we return it. It's literally as easy as that to add caching to this once you can get to the, like the brute force solution. So now let me run it to prove that it works. And unfortunately, I had a very silly bug. I wonder if you can spot it. The way we're taking the maximum of the result and the DFS call, will the result ever be anything larger than zero? Because we're never adding anything to the recursive call and we know the base case is always gonna be zero. And we have our total variable over here for a reason. When it's Alice's choice and we're calculating her score, we should take the total number of stones that we chose and add it to the recursive call, which also returns the number of stones Alice can get. But when it is Bob's turn, yes, Bob is taking this number of stones. This is the total number of stones Bob is taking. But remember, we're not storing Bob's score, nor are we getting the return value from Bob's score. So to take like the total and add it to this would be a contradiction because these are the stones that Bob shows, but the return value from this is Alice's stones. So we don't even need to add the total in this case. We're trying to minimize Alice's score. Why would we give her some free stones? stones from Bob. There's no need to do that. Now, let me quickly run it to prove to you that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. And honestly, if you want to improve the runtime, you could probably just use an actual three dimensional array rather than a hash map. A hash map has a bit more overhead. But what about the time and space complexity? Well, space complexity for this should be straightforward because the maximum size of this DP cache would be two because that's the number of possible states Alice could have and N because that's a possible number of states that I could have. And we talked about why M in the worst case could be as large as N as well. So times n squared is going to be the space complexity. The memory complexity is going to be similar. We know that's the number of times this DFS is going to be called and fully executed. But on each full execution, it's not like it's a constant time operation. We are in the worst case looping and in the worst case looping up to m times. So we would take the time complexity or the space complexity and multiply that by n one more time. And this gives us the time complexity. So pretty much n cubed is the time complexity and squared is the space complexity. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe and I'll see you soon.